let's pray. Father, we love you and uh, thank you so much for uh, just your desire for reconciliation and loving us. Mm -hmm. uh, you have shown time and time again just how committed you are mm -hmm. when we have broke fellowship, when we have sinned against you. <clears throat> You have been the one to have run to us and reconciliate that uh, relationship and restore us to you. And we thank you. Easter was a reminder mm -hmm. of how much you did for our, our salvation. And we thank you. Father, we do pray that uh, we can have that same heart in our marriages mm -hmm. and in our relationship with one another. And we, we appreciate and understand that uh, it can be a challenge, but we want to... Uh, Kind of look to you this morning and, and in our lives and in our marriages to con constantly provide that foundation with which we can build and reconcile and restore mm -hmm. and have the marriages that you want us to have. And Father, we do, uh, even as we think of the pain and the hurt that is going on in the world, we, we come to you as a God of compassion, yeah. of healing. Uh, I think of Chandrika's uh, dad here, and uh, I just pray. I, I, I continue to pray for some miracle, but God, I do pray certainly for the family to find peace and comfort and strength mm -hmm. in you and in one another. And, and Father, we, we do come to you at, at many times with, with not the answers, um, and, but just groans, and we pray that your spirit intervene and help us and and so bless us. Uh, please uh, help us to have hearts that are poured out for the world yeah. uh, with compassion and be moved and, and to help. Father, we love you. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, uh, good morning. Uh, we want to continue this theme of reconciliation or conflict resolution. Uh, I like the word reconciliation, and I'll explain more about that in a, in a few minutes. But I wanted to start by saying, and I think you can appreciate this, this, this whole idea is not about providing you with six kind of quick referral tips that will solve all of your relational issues and all of the, 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 the difficulties that you have, because I appreciate that that marriage and relationships are dynamic, they're fluid, there's things that happen, there's things that have, have influenced our relationships, uh, whether they be past experiences, whether it be our characters, but there's also things in currently going on. And like we've said, uh, our current crisis, our current situation can bring to surface stress and pressure and feelings and and so i just wanted to share at the beginning these are not we have by no means are providing all of the the solutions for you but just some foundations to build with and and more importantly some spiritual ones that that I, and i really believe god provides those foundations with which we can build upon and like i said um in the prayer, God is the one who forgives. <laughs> he's the one who has, uh, he's the one who has initiated. And, uh, you know, we fight our, our earthly molds and, uh, you know, our characters, but we've got to kind of imitate the heart of Jesus. And the whole point, and I shared this last week, is to, is to begin to move the needle in our relationships. And some of you are farther along and if i can use the word in maturity and teleos and have grown some some need some foundational things to continue to grow but the point is let's let's move the needle wherever we are at in our relationship with one another in our marriage and and to to grow to to make small incremental changes that over time will bring about greater change mm -hmm. in our life and so I think that also brings hope to me. It brings hope to me as a Christian because, hey, I, I want to be like Jesus, but I, I see the difference is <laughs> there's a big gap. But over time, if I can make small changes, I can grow more and more and more like him. And we want to have that same attitude in our marriage. Uh, as I 
we talked about last week, we've got to take initiative. Uh, we've got to be the ones to initiate resolution and to be reconciled. Don't wait for the other person. Confess my part or your part of the conflict. Get the beam out of your eyes, you know, reflect upon your part. Look at yourself first. Confess your specific ways that you have sinned or, or have fallen short and listen to the hurt and to the pain. Uh, remember again, hurt people hurt others. And so sometimes our conflict is a result of what's going on in our life. And we, we lash out and we, we've got to listen with, with compassion and empathy. Um, do you want to share anything else in that? So. No. no. <laughs> um, but do you notice a pattern? The, the, the pattern is, Guess where it starts? It starts with me. Uh, it, it, it starts with uh, me looking at myself. And I think that whole theme is going to continue as we, uh, as we go here. Uh, the fourth point is consider their perspective. And, uh, you know, Jesus in, or, or Paul in, in uh, Philippians chapter two refers to Jesus. And it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition again or vain conceit where are we looking we're looking at ourselves. but in humility consider others better than yourselves each of you should look not only to your own interests but also to the interest of others your attitude should be the same as that of christ jesus and i realize that's a that is a pretty high bar a pretty high standard that jesus sets but that that really is as disciples that's who we want to go to and this idea of considering is to think about to regard to value to make a first priority to to kind of lead the way your your heart follows your thinking and your attitude and and all of these things as i begin to think about and reflect about kind of reconciliation and resolving issues there's got to be some time at, kind of in the moment things get heated and perhaps we've got to in, in some instances kind of settle down and make sure that we're 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 focusing first on ourselves to think better is to think superior <laughs> above in rank and and christ turns this all our old thinking up up on its head it's not about you it's not about uh uh, what is bouncing around and the tapes playing in your head. And we all have that, right? In, in, in conflict, and in, in we, we, we play the tapes. And, and, and we, we are considering and we are thinking more about ourselves than we are about the other person. And we are, tr we are thinking about our perspective versus their perspective. And it's a tricky thing because perspective is not always right or wrong. And, and it, it, it can be shaped, as we know, by many different things in our lives, our past, past experiences, past history with others or this person, our personality, some are critical thinkers, some are negative, pessimistic, some, again, are conflict avoiders. There's, there's, there's biases that all of us bring into our relationships. I'll never forget just a, a, a perspective that was kind of burned in my mind uh, years ago. It was actually with Tony and Melanie when, when they were leading the church in Toronto. And uh, it, if many of you remember years ago, I don't remember the year, but uh, OJ Simpson was accused of, of, of murder. And there was this scene that captured kind of the world's attention as he was driving his white Bronco down the interstate and, and the news cameras were capturing it and, and we were all following it and the police were following behind. And, and Tony asked the question, I remember this, is, is OJ guilty? And he gathered the staff together and, and uh, had us kind of write things out silently. And we submitted it to him. And I remember it's almost embarrassing to say at now, but I said he, he's, he's guilty as sin because that, that to, to me, I was like, why is he running? It, it, it didn't make sense to me. Perspective. 
And then I remember, and it might have been Howard had shared a perspective of you've, you've never been pulled over for no reason. And I remember Howard sharing that, and I'm going, I mean, that really happens? I mean, really? And he said, yes. And, and I share that to say because it, it, it shapes our, our backgrounds and our biases all kind of play to, to conflicts and things that we, we experience. And, uh, you know, our perspective can be so different when it comes to resolving issues. You know, why are they upset? What could be happening and reflecting and thinking about what, what, what has hurt them and, and that background? What, is there something that I have done? Again, trying to, trying to see from their shoes with empathy and compassion. Do you want to share? Um, when I think of um, opportunities to try and gain perspective, I love how Jesus interacts with um, Mary and Martha when he's at their home and he knows he's going to get dinner. And we, most of us know the story, Martha's distracted. Um, and he says, or she says to Jesus, don't you care? And of course, Jesus cared. And we can stand back and go, you know, and say, well, that's obvious. But I love how he teaches to have perspective. Uh, he doesn't say, oh, Martha, you foolish woman. You know, he doesn't say, get out of yourself, you sinner. He just says, Martha, Martha, you know, you're distracted about many things, but he doesn't make it about right or wrong. He just says, Mary's chosen what is better. And there's times when, you know, when we see ourselves in a conflict, small or large, <clears throat> hopefully with some of these, you know, steps that we're looking at, we can keep them at the small impasse and resolve them, you know, to be reconciled by taking the perspective. What, what is this person trying to say? Um, you know, I appreciate my perspective. And of course, I think we all think our perspective is right. But that's why I love Jesus saying, um, Mary's chosen what is better. And I see what Jesus is doing is he's actually validating Martha's concern. Um, and I, I believe that if, if we can do that with one another, we validate their perspective that it's not right or wrong. We're trying to come to this place of agreement where we actually agree with God and allow ourselves to be um, considered. And so when we look at perspective, when we take Jesus um, stand on considering others better than ourselves and, you know, wanting to validate someone else's perspective. I think our marriage is the best place to practice this. Sure. But when you look at all of these six things that we will have shared by the end of this time, we can take this with our children. You know, those of us who have the preteen and teen kids or adult children, they all have perspectives and opinions. Yeah, that's right but sometimes we shut them down because we don't agree. Um, but if we validate our kids, you know, perspective, a lot of times it will um, initiate great conversation. <clears throat> then we can take it to work and we can take it, um, you know, with other family members. So anyway, just this point, I love how Jesus teaches us um, that we can gain perspective with a heart of humility to listen and don't make it about being right or wrong, but just, um, you know, the heart to be understood. Yeah. Thanks. You know, even last week as we were wrapping up um, the uh, discussion, you know, Alex gave a perspective for, for many of us that was, you know, what was good to hear because, uh, you know, I had assumed, you know, that life could be somewhat, I will not say easier, but there, there wasn't as much work for some of us. And uh, so my perspective was different. And Alex shared his perspective that he is actually working harder, longer. Some of you even shared and said, yes, we are in the same, same boat. And just that it, it, it changes. Now, as we went on to talk, um, the last thing I wanna do is provide Alex a list of another 10 things. Why don't you do this, 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 this? <laughs> 
but just simply simply to listen and to hear his perspective and he he shared later he said maybe just talking about it has helped and so it, again it's another example of if, if we try to hear and listen and there is another perspective we can we can bring we can actually bring our relationships together mm -hmm. another one is uh, tell the truth tactfully uh, I don't know if you've ever read through the, the Proverbs uh, and uh, just seen how much um, the tongue and relationships are, are discussed. I, I years ago have gone, went through the, the Proverbs and just circled and, and kind of titled the different themes, you know, laziness, purity, you know, money, integrity. Uh, and obviously words are, and our tongue is, is used so often through it here's a few uh, proverbs 13 8 reckless words pierce like a sword but the tongue of the wise brings healing 13 3 he who guards his lips guards his life but he who speaks rashly comes to ruin 15 1 a gentle answer turns away wrath and harsh <laughs> words stir up anger I think that's a very important one because I think notice what happens in conflict when we are trying to get our point across <clears throat> what what anger can be raised intensity can be raised emotion can be raised we feel that they are not listening so volume can be raised and so what happens it, it goes from one <clears throat> state to another and i love this passage because and, and it, it flies in the face of my reasoning and my thinking but i think it's profound to to stop and a gentle answer turns away wrath the last thing we want to do is keep escalating our conflict and our battle um and, and so we think that our intensity will win the argument we think if we speak with more passion, we speak with more feeling, more emotion, more volume, that will get the point across. And I love it. Gentle answer stops. It turns away wrath. You, you begin, if you, you, if you answer gently, it's hard for the other person to respond and continue to escalate. They often follow your lead. Now, I think we've got to be genuine when we do that and not just use it as a try to a manipulative tool, but it's an important thing to, to remember. The tongue, verse chapter uh, Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. My question is, what fruit do you want to eat? You know, what fruit do you want growing in your marriage? What kind of tree do you want growing? One that is, that is healthy, reconciled, fruitful, or, or one that, that, that is rotten. And, and, and we've, our words are foundation. They're like fertilizer for that tree. And, and what kind of fruit do you want? Again, we've got to be honest with one another. And you can be honest and still respectful and loving and tactful. We need to speak truthfully. You hurt me, but the way you say it is important. It will take humility. We've got to be able to speak about important and, and even difficult relational issues, things that have hurt us, but, and we've got to have humility and even vulnerability when we do it but we can't speak in superlatives. I think some of these we know, you always, you never, we, we can't kind of throw out historical scrolls and unravel, you have done this, this is the list of your sins. None of us like to have that thrown in our face. Again, trying to remember that God is the one who removes our sins from us as far as East is from the West. And so as disciples, certainly in our marriages, we've got to have this idea of, of starting over fresh and, and clean slates and not being reminded of our sins and our failures, but being tactful in our, in our resol resolution. Sure. Me? Yep. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, the Bible just has so many rich scriptures on, um, you know, the tongue and, um, you know, where things come from. James, who's the brother of Jesus, so he, you know, he, he cuts to the chase in his short book, and he's pretty clear. Um, and it's a great study. We don't have time to go through all of it. But if, if you were to pick up in James 3, um, just starting in verse 1 and go through um, like 4, 7, um, you know, it's a lot about the tongue and, and, and it, it's got this destructive power, but we can use it um, to direct power in the right way, or we could do it in a destructive way. But at the beginning of chapter four, he says, um, you know, what does cause quarrels and fights among us, um, don't they come from desires that battle within you? And again, that's where Sean is saying, you know, all of these things are about looking at us first, and the battle is, is, is within me. So if we are having an argument, a disagreement, what is it in me that I'm so upset about that I am not getting? And, and he goes on and he talks about humility, um, but he actually makes it, um, you know, about God. He, he refers to submission to God is, you know, is really at heart. And the um, quarrels and the fights come from wrong motives. And so, you know, we can all... Um, point our finger at the other person, at our spouse, at our kids, and and make a case. Um, and I know there's lawyers among us. <laughs> you know, we can make a case with our with our heart and tongue to prove someone wrong. But God challenges us right. to take the path of humility um, in in answering that. And then one other scripture that um, I know most of us are probably aware of in Ephesians four um, twenty nine through 32, um, you know, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And a lot of times we read this um, as an individual person, because we hear it in the English and it says, you know, it's talking about you, but really it's to the communal church. And it's to us as our marriage, we're, we're, we're a union. Mm -hmm. um, but we can apply it individually, we can certainly apply it collectively. But I, I like how he, um, how he phrases this. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, helpful to their needs, that it may benefit not me, but those who hear me, who listen, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. The high road, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, <clears throat> forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. You know, in this whole direction here, <clears throat> excuse me, for how our speech can be and how our heart can be, Paul you know, sandwiches in here about not grieving the Holy Spirit. That's another whole study in and of itself, but it is the place and time where God actually has grief, where he regrets, like in Noah, I, he regretted that he made man. He was grieved in his spirit. Um, you know, he, I was just reading about David and Saul, and, you know, God said in that moment, he regretted that he had made Saul king. And it's a response of God's holiness and his righteousness that when he sees sin so glaring um, that it grieves his spirit, but it also has to prompt him to act because of his holiness, which is why we had Noah in the ark. But I, <clears throat> I look at this as such a compelling passage because it's in this context of unwholesome speech versus compassion and kindness. And so, you know, if we're making the effort to agree with God in our confession and taking the initiative and perspective, I think it would be hard to grieve God's spirit. It would be a whole lot easier to take the road of compassion and kindness. But even 
from this, it's a, it's a holy motivator to realize, right. wow, when, I, when my speech is that unwholesome, it's not about winning an argument and thinking, you know, I scored. It's about, have I grieved God's Holy Spirit by my speech? Um, and then one other thing with being tactful, I don't know if men do this as much as women, but I know we can as women, is we, we use the superlatives of you always, <laughs> you never do this. Um, but those are just damaging because it's communicating that right. record of wrongs uh, that leaves this unforgiving taste, you know, in the hearer's mind and heart. Um, so that's just one of those small things when we're trying to be tactful in our communication and, and take perspective is to try and not think of it as you, you're the one who always does this or you never do this, but look for, you know, how am I just contributing to this so that we can um, bring about reconciliation? Yeah. And that leads us to the last, uh, the last point is that the focus really is on reconciliation and not just in resolution. Um, I mean, I think <clears throat> how many times perhaps have you had kind of what we call a peace agreement? There's no bullets, no, no war going on, but, you know there's no established reestablished reconciliation see the the point and the the desire that god has for us in our marriages when we have some difficulties and challenges and fights and it is to make sure that we are always coming back as one our relationship is is restored we are reconciled and there is a difference because reconciliation is about restoring the relationship bringing it back together as one to function resolution is important because it's about resolving the the, the problems and the issues but again we can solve some but not necessarily come together and in first peter 3 <clears throat> peter writes seek or search for or strive for peace and pursue it. This idea of peace, as we know, I mean, peace is not just silence from, from the fight or the battle or the bullets or the bombs or the things that go on. That We have peace treaties, but we know that there's no real reconciliation amongst these countries. <laughs> they, they just have a moment of silence. Yeah. And that's not what God wants. He wants wholeness, shalom, quietness, completeness, not just freedom from war. He wants the relationship store, restored and that there's, there's harmony and, and that the relationship works together. And it's not about being right. And this, this is hugely important. Um, you know, it's, it's not even always about just trying to resolve the issue, although I think that's important. It's making sure that ultimately we come to a point of, of reconciling our relationship. And even Paul, which again would, would fly in the face of, of, of kind of the world today, but Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and, and if you know 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of things going on in the church. There's a lot of dynamics that have have caused, hey, I'm following Paul, I'm following Peter, I'm following Christ. And, and you have these groups and quarrels and, and, and difficulties. And, and so much so that they actually began to take one another to court. And almost, that's like saying, hey, I'm going to prove my case. I'm going to prove I'm right. I'm going to show that you are wrong. And Paul says, you're defeated already. <laughs> Why not rather be wronged? And what is his point? Man, I, I, I value your relationship. Not just that you're right. I want unity. I, 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 want, I want you to be back in a relationship with one another. Not, not just, hey, I, 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 won the, I won the war. I won the argument. And again, I think it's, it's, a, it's an important thing. That, that we understand the difference and that we're committed to making sure that our relationship is, is, is reconciled and restored. Do you want to share thoughts there? Um, yeah, I love how Jesus in um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, which in and of itself is 
so convicting, um, you know, to just put it into practice. But uh, in, in chapter five, where he's giving the Beatitudes, uh, we often read them as blessed or blessed be. Um, but a lot of translations will also indicate happy. And the beatitude that Jesus says in 5.9 is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And it's not just about, um, you know, being a, a maker of peace uh, in the sense of just loving, as Sean was saying, or liking the idea of peace, um, but actually going after it and um, creating it, not running from it. I think, you know, when we shared um, the week prior, you know, naturally being one who wants to flee or flight, that does not necessarily make us a peacemaker. It's not someone who um, is actively making peace, um, potentially running from it, ignoring it, um, not acknowledging that it's actually right. there. And so Jesus is saying, you know, when you become a peacemaker, um, you know, God considers you his children, which is, you know, I trust that is what we, we want to be. Um, and I think, you know, in all of this, we can think differently about things and it doesn't mean we're not at peace. Um, I think there's things that we can learn to acknowledge from one another, acknowledge from other people, um, and, and realize that, you know, we can still walk hand in hand. We can still be together, even though we may see things a little bit different, um, that it doesn't have to cause, um, you know, that this disharmony among us. Um, you know, I think in, uh, you know, what Guy Hammond has been promoting a lot in his strength and weakness ministry you know, is the idea um, that, that I can accept who you are. We can accept someone who doesn't agree or live, um, you know, by the standard of God that we see in the scriptures, um, but I can still, um, you know, care who you are. Um, and so it doesn't mean that I am agreeing but we can still accept one another if we don't agree with maybe how to spend this money or how to spend um, this specific time or, you know, where to go when we get to leave the house. Um, there, you know, there's minor things to major things. Um, you know, we, we see it clearly as we look at the news in America and knowing that there's an election coming. Um, even within the, you know, within the, the churches, there is huge disparity between, um, you know, the, the Republican and um, Democrat. But as brothers and sisters, we have to fight in a godly way to be peacemakers and acknowledge the differences, um, you know, but still desire um, unity and harmony. And so I, I love Jesus you know, teaching that if we pursue being a peacemaker, um, it, it'll bring a sense of, of blessing to our life, happiness to our life. And not only that, but the spiritual um, confirmation that God looks at us as his children. Amen. <clears throat> you know, and pursuing peace speaks and even challenges those of us who may be <laughs> conflict avoiders because we, we run away and think by not Kind of dealing with it we're actually bringing peace to pursue peace means i'm going to have the the kind of the guts humility vulnerability to actually go after making sure things are resolved and reconciled and 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 i don't just kind of back away and run from the fight mm -hmm. and don't av and avoid the the issues that's not a real peacemaker Again, that's, that's, there's no bombs going off. There's no, nothing kind of flying around, but we know, <laughs> we know that there's no wholeness. We know that there's no restoration of the relationship. There's coldness, there's distance. That's not what God wants. He wants us to, to come together. And so those of us that like peace, but we run away from it, 
it, it also challenges we've got to pursue peace, real peace, genuine <laughs> shalom, wholeness, and, 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 and unity. And like I said, uh, wrapping up here, it, it, this is, goodness, this is by no means any exhaustive list. We could go on. There's, there's books and volumes, and there's, there's men and women who have, have devoted their lives to, to reconciliation and, and how to resolve conflict. So, but this is, again, to provide us some foundation, biblically, scripturally, Christ-like, having him as our model to help us. And I think it starts, if you've noticed, it starts with us kind of looking at ourselves, initiating. God wants me, Sean, to look in the mirror, to start with myself before I look at them. God wants, and I know this is easier said than done, but it, it means me kind of not it needs taking some inventory. It may mean stopping to, to make sure I have some personal reflection to make myself nothing. And, and again, relational issues, they're challenging. That's the relationships are just not easy. They're fluid. They're dynamic. And, and some issues may take some time or some, some of these, you may need outside perspective. Yeah. Some outside eyes to, to see how you handle and how you, what difficulties arise. I think some barometer, can you, can you pray together? Can you, can you, can, will you build that third strand back into your relationship to reconcile one another? Again, back to the theme of, of strands, reconciliation begins to wrap the strand back again so that it is strong. Because as we are not reconciled, we are two kind of strands not wrapped together frayed. <laughs> and frayed and things. And, and it supports no weight. And our marriages support no weight if they just are, are held together by single strands. They're meant to be wrapped and interwoven together. And then obviously as Christians, to have that third strand, God, more tightly uh, wound around us. And so... We've talked about taking initiative, confessing our part, listening to the hurt and pain, considering their perspective, and telling the truth tactfully, and focusing on reconciliation. Hope this has helped. I need to want to say a prayer, and sure. we'll, uh, we'll close. Okay. God, thank you so much um, that you have, um, you know, stood the test and, and um, the journey with each of us, and that you've not um, given up on us, that you have loved us, um, you know, without judgment, that you have loved us um, with grace and mercy. And uh, Father, we can't help but feel an incredible, um, you know, sense of gratitude, Father. And, and I know, God, for each of us, um, when, when we choose to, to follow you, when we choose to make Jesus king of our life um, and lordship, uh, Father, none of us truly really really want to grieve your spirit father that is dwelling in us but god we do um we do pray that we acknowledge at times that that we have done that and perhaps we will do that again and we ask for forgiveness in advance and for the past um but god uh you know we just pray that out of great humility and um, your incredible gift of grace to us and the forgiveness that you've offered all of us through your son, that Father, we would choose to um, choose reconciliation as you um, pursued us, uh, you know, from, from the garden on. You've pursued us to reconcile us back to you, and we're incredibly grateful for that. So, Father, we pray that, um, you know, as we've looked at uh, how to help our marriages and how to ultimately bring you glory through them father we pray that you um, are glorified and uh, that you know that that our marriages grow and shine um, and father that we become great peacemakers in our home with our families uh, father as we are your children and that um, it impacts the, our relationships um, through work, uh, family, whatever it may be, God. Uh, we pray that the rest of this day is glorious um, to you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.